Well, thank you all for coming. Always pleased to see a large crowd. Um, so I'm, I'm from Switzerland, as you can tell from my accent. Um, I spent about a decade doing supercomputing after I got my PhD in physics. So I'm a migrating scientist, if you want, into computer science. And I spent the last four or five years in machine learning, two different startups, and uh, the last two and a half years at H2O, which is um, the makers of the product called H2O as well. And that's open source machine learning software. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But you can also read about my life in a Fortune magazine and follow me on Twitter. So I want to talk about AI, because everybody wants to talk about AI these days. It seems to come about every 20 years or so. And hopefully this time it's for real. Um, what can it do to us? What can you do with it? So first, a little bit of an overview. So computer science is the, the actual field, right, that does all this stuff with computers. And machine learning is a part of it. And so is artificial intelligence and deep learning. So OK, just look at these for now for a second. But we'll go into each of those to define them a little better. And H2O does a little bit of all of those. So computer science is the, the art of dealing with computers, if you want, but trying to make things scale, repeatable, um, understand how these systems work, how you compute stuff logically. That's computer science. And you need that to do something intelligent, one could argue, especially if you want to teach a machine to become intelligent. So what is an intelligent machine? It's something that just does a task that you define. You say, I want this task to be done, and it should just like do it really well. Okay, That's artificial intelligence. And you could say it's good enough to drive a car. And yes, to some extent, that is artificial intelligence. And that's why we're talking about it these days. Now, machine learning is a piece of artificial intelligence because you need to learn from data. Otherwise, you can't perform these tasks. Everything is data. Everything you see, you hear, you smell, everything the machine has to perceive is also data. So the study of how you can learn from data, that's called machine learning. Okay. And now deep learning, that's the stuff that's even hotter than everything above. Well, maybe not quite. Some people say artificial intelligence is hotter. That's why we changed the company name to h2o.ai. So deep learning is what's used in pretty much all of Google. If you listen to Jeff Dean's talks at Google, he'll show you a graph that shows how much of Google is, is done with deep learning. It's an astounding amount. So every business unit has to use deep learning in order to be qualified as good practices. So um, what it actually does, it's, it's, it's part of machine learning that does um, teach the machine to find higher level uh, abstractions. So what is something round, or what is something green, or what's an animal or not? So the, the, the tool, the machine learning tool here, is learning these concepts. And how it does it, it's through multiple nonlinear transformations, mathematically speaking. Okay, And it's just, um, it's just how it is. It's not necessarily the right way. It's not necessarily how the brain does it. It's just how the current state of art um, machine learning tools are doing it. So it's, it's evolved from the 70s, where we had something like this. You would have incoming data. Let's say you wanted to predict whether somebody will default on a loan or not. And you have their income, their credit score, and their loan amount. You would assume that these numbers all make some sense right, for this question to be answered. So this, this model would operate on these incoming numbers. So each of these dots here is a number. That's the incoming values. And each of these connections is also a number. And the numbers are being learned, these connections. So the more the connection is, the, the value of that number, the more that value that's coming in gets propagated to the next layer. So assume your credit score is really high, and this weight here is really high, then this neuron here will get a big number. And then there's a nonlinearity that's applied that turns this number into a new number, according to this formula. And this formula is a simple formula. It's usually just something like, find me the maximum of this value and 0. So if you're negative, you're 0. And if you're bigger than 0, you're whatever you are. That's a nonlinear function. That cuts up some half of your space. And that's good enough to make it interesting. Because that nonlinearity makes this model highly complex, especially if you have multiple of these layers. Because each of these numbers here 
then again get propagated to the next layer. And again and again and again. And that's what makes it deep. The more of these layers you have of these hidden neurons that can get activated by the previous layers, the deeper the model gets and the more states you can kind of internally represent. And then at the end, you get two numbers out, and you can turn these into probabilities for default or non-default. And that's basically the model's predictions. And that's what people use for credit risk models and so on. They don't always use neural nets, but they often do. Sometimes they do. Nowadays, they probably do more. And you can imagine if you have 10 of these layers with thousands of neurons each, you can have lots and lots of logic encoded in there. So you can basically program any logic into this system if you have the numbers just right. Now, and if you have enough neurons and enough layers, this is um, able to basically encode your Windows program, right? If, if you do everything right, this will do the right logic. But of course, that's theory. In practice, you have some noise and you're, you're only doing uh, something with millions of weights. You're not going to be able to memorize trillions of logical things. But it, it's able to make these nonlinear deductions from data. It can say if this is this much and this is this much, and together their difference is such and such, but not more than this, then you're going to be this and this and so on. And all this is encoded in these numbers. So that's why deep learning is it's kind of powerful these days, because um, in the old days, you would have the same model. This is nothing new, right? This is from the 70s. But nowadays, you can actually train this with big neural nets on GPUs, on GPU clusters. GPUs are like the gamer PC components that make the games fast. It's dedicated hardware that does nothing else but multiply numbers over and over again. That's exactly what happens in these neural nets. So the idea is that it's a simple model. It's non-linear, so it can express a lot. You can configure it any way you want. And there's even papers now coming out that learn how to configure themselves, right? The neural nets don't have to be manually configured. It learns it as part of the whole training process. So it can self-adjust the whole structure, with how many layers, how many neurons per layer, what's the activation function, and so on. You can fine-tune it with more data. So the more data comes in, the more you can correct these weights. And how do you learn these weights? I haven't said that yet. So these numbers that connect, you have to learn them. And what it does typically is, for every example that comes in that you're learning from, you know what the actual answer is, the correct answer. What you're doing is you're, you're making a prediction that's slightly wrong because your weights weren't perfect. You're looking at what was wrong and you're fixing it. It's called gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent. So people are taking the correction terms and propagating it backwards through the network to fix everything that was wrong in a way that makes it better, just a little bit better. You don't want to totally learn everything that was wrong, otherwise jumping around too much. Just applying a little bit of a correction, saying, yeah, you, you better reduce this number a little, you better increase this one a little bit, and so on. Until all the weights are kind of balancing around to the right place. And it's astoundingly uh, stable, this whole model, because you would think that there are so many local minima, right? There are so many combinations of values that you can set that you'll never find the actual correct one. But it turns out for big data that many, many of these configurations are all kind of good enough. You just have to find one of the many that are good enough. And any of these good ones will be good enough to solve your business problems in ways that you haven't been able to do before. So for example, Google can translate voice into text better than ever, better than anybody ever did. Or to translate images, um, caption them, right? Say what's in an image. Or do real-time video and so on. Based on self-diving parts that they need, they need to see what's left and right somebody jumping into the street or not. All that is being done at a level that's much better than ever. Um, however, they're not that easy to interpret, right? What do you do with these millions of numbers that are encoded somewhere? You're going to know whether this fraud model is not good or not for your business problem. If somebody says you're fraud, are you going to say, well, OK, your machine must have been right, or are you going to say, no, 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 I don't believe you. Show me why. And then they're going to say, well, you don't really know, right? So that's a bit of a problem these days that people can't really tell why the model is making these predictions because it's such a complicated mess. Even though it's conceptually simple, it's actually not easy to understand what happens on a per observation case by case basis. But it affects you. You want to know why it happened and you can't. Um, 
often it also is a little bit hard to tune. It's getting better these days with these self-tuning methods and, and people have done lots with um, automatic learning and so on, but it still has lots of parameters, right? Every layer could have an arbitrary number of neurons that can be connected differently. They don't have to be connected that way. They can connect to themselves over time and so on. It can be a more complicated structure of neurons. I was going to say, uh, if you reject a person by credit, by law, you have to give them four reasons, yes. or there's reason codes. So there's an arbitrary process. You can take a black box model and do a sensitivity analysis to see what variables are most predictive for that. If you have variables bin, then you can use that to give what bins apply to that record, and then you can give reasons for that record. So it doesn't matter if it's an ensemble complex system or complex um, a deep learning system, you can still come up with record level reasons for an arbitrary system. Yes, so we are talking to um, companies like Capital One that are, uh, they made that t-shirt for us actually, which um, are doing these things, yes. and other banks as well, and, and yes, they are very interested in using these models, but historically they've been using GLMs, maybe GBMs, and they have a hard time. Uh, they also want to understand how stable is this over time, out of time, what happens if I train on the last five years and then tomorrow what's going to happen if something new happens, you know, if some, somebody suddenly has a much higher credit score than before. Is this non-linearity going to turn everything upside down just because it never saw it before? How, how stable is it? So. It's not just the, um, can I tell you what the model was doing, but also how would it have reacted in this in this case? And you're right, partial dependence plots and so on can help. Sensitivity analysis can be done. And that's exactly what we're working on these days. We actually had Trevor Hasty and Rob Tipshirani, the two professors at Stanford at our office today for an hour and a half to talk about that. Let me ask you one question. Uh, I was probably one of the first people to start shorting the Lending Club. And the reason I did it is I, our Harvard Business School had them as an entrepreneur of the year last May, the year ago May. And I looked at it, I, I talked to the guy, and I said, I think you haven't priced the loans high enough. I said, you need 200 or 400 more basis points. And he kind of listened to me for a while, then he, then he didn't listen. So I said, OK, I know more than that guy. Now, you know, he's a French guy, so uh, so what happened, I started shorting and it went from like 25 to 4, so I guess I'm right. But uh, the, the thing that I ask is, how do you detect fraud? Because in internet-based lending, lots of guys don't even exist. They're just, they're just uh, a piece of paper, right? You create a piece of paper. Whereas, you know, face-to-face -face lending, at least the person has to show up. So. How do, you, how do you account for fraud or the a statistical storm of fraud, which, which I think there's a lot of those guys in the D and the E lending. Yeah, you raise a very good point, this, um, that deep learning doesn't solve your data science problem for you, right? It just is a tool that you can employ, and it's a good tool often, but it doesn't think for you. It doesn't relieve you of proper cross-validation, doesn't relieve you of understanding what the features mean, doesn't understand, uh, relieve you of thinking about what you want to know about something. So um, knowing the data is way more important than having deep learning versus GBM or GLM or anything. I agree with you. So this is for experts that know what they're doing, such as Google. They can now make it a little better by employing these tools, right? But even they make mistakes. They got the flu prediction wrong, or so it was like a famous study where they got it totally wrong as well. So I don't know if you're following any readers, but I came across a report somewhere that deep learning was initially embraced because it required far less quantity of data to the results. And now we're headed towards turning that off with a large quantity. So yes, the model is only as good as it can suck up information, right? So a small model can only suck up so much information and then it's full. You can't tweak the numbers anymore. It's not going to memorize 100 million different directions, let's say. It can only handle like 10 directions. Now, if you have a model with millions and millions of coefficients, it can potentially learn way more interactions between them and all that. So in order to fill those those numbers up with reasonable values, you need to pump up enough data into that system to like let it learn, right? And there's so much um, a need for data that you cannot have enough data almost. So for the big models, there's never ever a, a moment where you have too much data. Even in today's world, 
you can basically train for days and days on lots and lots of data and the model still gets better. So the model now can absorb the data complexity because the model itself is big as well. So deep learning doesn't really help you get along with lesser data. Mm -hmm. Our more data is always good, but if you have deep learning, it doesn't necessarily solve for the uh, it does also sometimes. Let's say you have a spiral problem. You want to detect red from black spiral that are inter interleaved, right? And you want to build a GLM, a logistic regression model that says red or black. It's not going to find it because it makes a straight line. Or a random forest with like only 10 trees or so has no chance to cut up a spiral out of a 2D uh, surface. But a deep learning model could learn the curve with fewer neurons or fewer model complexity than all the other models and hence um, use less data basically to learn it and also a smaller model. So th there's pros and cons, but it's usually harder to train. It, it's a positive thing and a negative thing, right? It needs a lot of data, but it, it can also absorb this much data. But so can other models, like a GBM can also learn a lot. So based on what he said and what I'm doing there, are you saying that uh, deep learning is more suited for problems where the domain is kind of more static, like images, I mean, dogs haven't changed their shape in a long time, but where, where the data is really dependent on the environment, like, uh, for example, the interest rate environment or something, uh, the deep learning is not the most appropriate thing. Um, it depends on the features, right? If you make good features that are meaningful at, at any given time, and then you can make a good model from, the, from those features, and then deep learning is fine again. But if you give features that have a lot of variance in it and they start shifting over, over the days and change meaning and all that, then, then maybe it, no model is good other than a very simple statistical model. But uh, like uh, you said earlier, that it, it's very difficult to explain the reasoning behind this. So I may be capturing interest rate, but I don't know what's that. Right. Like totally, absolutely, super important, how how important that interest rate is, let's say, or this spread or something. Right. In that case, there may be a shift in data, but it will take me many days or weeks of new data to really understand what hit me. Correct. So you, you often have to retrain models if, if you know that there's shift happening. You have to think about data still. So there's nothing that saves you from all that. So especially nowadays where people can build models quickly, the danger is that they don't understand what they're doing. And we see that a lot, that people actually build models blindly, assuming that the model will fix all the lack of understanding of the data. No, that's not my question. My question was that, uh, because you cannot pin down the outcome of the model to a certain variable. So uh, is deep learning suited for that kind of problem where the feature space is changing rapidly? Well, if the meaning of each feature is changing, if the range of the feature values is changing, for example, then, then it's not a good model because it, you would have to manually cut it off and say you cannot be more than 12 or whatever the, the range was of the training data. So that's part of the data science pipeline that I was referring to. You need to know what you're giving the model, right? So I just want to go back here because I have, I have 48 more slides or something, or, or actually 38 more slides. Um, this is what AI was about. Uh, over 60 years ago, John McCarthy at Dartmouth um, coined the phrase, right, artificial intelligence. So this is an old concept. Um, he said, let's do something over the summer. He actually said, we want to do a two-month, 10-man study over the summer to basically learn whether every aspect of learning can be um, described, that the machine can be made to simulate it. And he really thought this could be done in the summer because it's just a couple of logical abstractions, and you put them together, and you, you approve some theorem, and it's all good. Um, Turned out that it took him all his life, and he did a lot of uh, influential stuff. He was at Stanford, and across this whole life, um, we are still not able to actually just say artificial intelligence is here, right? We still have um, a plow, basically, even though this is not a plow. This is a fertilizer 
robot, but I didn't find a mechanical plow picture. Um, but you get the idea. This machine will not just run away like this machine back here, right, and, and eat something. This is still just going to do one task that it was designed to do. And I want to give you a quick overview over this, the history of AI and how, how we got to do these tasks and how it became more and more apparent that we can do more general artificial intelligence-like tasks. So in 97, Kasparov said, nobody can ever beat me, especially no computer, right? He was very convinced about that. And uh, IBM Deep Blue managed to beat him with 30 custom processors, IBM chips that computed 60 billion moves in three minutes, the allotted time per move. So they literally computed 60 billion moves and just brute forced the whole thing, basically, and were able to then outperform the human brain because he couldn't think of anything smart anymore that would beat that robot's uh, preview of what's possible. Like, everything that he can come up with, the robot can also like see. So then people said, well, if you could drive a car, then maybe then you're more intelligent. As I said earlier, it seems plausible, right? If you can really drive a car around the city and all that in rain, in windy conditions, with people jumping in front of you and you brake at the right time and all that. And it turned out that 2005 already, they were able to run um, a machine through hundreds of miles um, through the desert and all, and it would drive the right way, evade uh, steep things and cacti and all that. And that was done with more data. So they would actually collect data in real time, process all that with analog devices, not just digital devices, but of course, analog devices would then have some image pixels and they would turn those into signals and they would say, oh, here's something in the right side, there's something like go a little left more or something. But it wasn't doing deep learning yet. It was maybe doing some neural nets, but I think it was um, mostly other stuff, just regular rule-based systems. And, and um, if this upper pixel is like black, then you must go left or something. And they, they had all this human knowledge encoded into these systems that now finally, with the latest hardware and all that, could do this task. And it was pretty clumsy, but it worked. Then everybody knows Jeopardy. Have you seen this video? Have you actually seen this? It's pretty amazing what these two guys can do, right? They were really fast. Like, no one ever can think that fast. And these guys were saying, oh, I got it, I got it, I got it. But the time it took them to think about the question and press the button was actually longer than what the machine would take to electronically parse the text string that was given to them in English text. So this, this IBM machine was reading a string and answering it and saying, I got it, all in milliseconds, while these poor guys had to like listen to somebody read the, the question out, right? So it wasn't quite fair. And so basically, they were outpressed by the machine. I think they would have known the answers just as well, but it was basically the the, 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 the fact that they could um, look up in this Hadoop cluster, actually, with 90 machines, 16 terabytes of RAM. They had parsed all the encyclopedias of the world into memory, into lookup tables, hand-coded rules, and everything was in memory processing. Even though it was a Hadoop cluster, it was still doing it in memory. So this is what H2O is doing nowadays in memory processing, right? This was the, the first time this really uh, worked on a large scale and was pretty impressive, but it's still just information retrieval based on rules that are hard-coded. So I actually think it's not correct that it was pressing an electronic button. I think one of the rules that the Jeopardy people in, in place was that it has to do a mechanical Oh, Jeopardy was pressing a, a mechanical button, you're saying? Oh, okay. Apparently, Jeopardy was pressing a mechanical button. So uh, some, some electronic button said, push this magnet um, voltage up so that it punches a mechanical button. But it could be doing that faster than the humans because to compute whether the confidence was high enough on this particular lookup answer, that computation was milliseconds. And the humans also took milliseconds, but maybe 100 milliseconds versus 10 or so. Is there a description of that algorithm somewhere online? For uh, what Jeopardy was doing? Yes, yes. I have a link here, actually. These, are all, these links are all live. Um, 
So then all, all of you know that this Atari game maybe happened a couple of years ago and then now AlphaGo. So first this Atari game, it was basically playing simple old school Atari games that we grew up with. And it would just look at the raw pixel values. It would say, ah, okay, these are the values of the pixels. I would get them in electronic form to the deep learning tool. And it would then learn from that and would say, okay, um, I lost. And then it would say, well, if, if I press the left, right button on my controller, oh, suddenly I won. What, what did I just do, right? And it would self-create basically its own training data to learn from it. It's reinforcement learning where it, it learned from its own behavior whether it was doing the right thing or not. And after playing with itself for, for millions of repeats, it would kind of learn how to play Pong. It knows when the ball is here, I need to move the pad over or something. And it would just like learn these rules, how to act given a state of the system. And that was fun. And that was deep learning. Because each of these pixel values would then turn some neurons on and so on. And then AlphaGo had this many combinations. So 2 to the uh, 10 to the, what is it? 2 times 10 to the 170. You know the universe is 10 to the 80 atoms or so. So this is 10 to the 170. This is way more than the universe's atoms. So it's, it's ridiculously a large number, right? How many states this board can have. And still, um, Google's DeepMind was able to beat the best human, whatever that means. But the human thought um, he was particularly fond of himself, or people knew that he was so smart. You need intuition. You can't just like brute force it. There's no way you can compute all these states. But the machine doesn't have to brute force it. They can also do something smart. They can also look ahead. They can also do tree-based logic, like if I go here or here, what will happen? It can also play against itself. It can also use GPU clusters. It can practice against itself for, for many millions of, of games. And that's what they did. So even this now seems like, yeah, seems logical, right? Now we all think this is not that big a deal. It's just, it's just good programming, good computer science. and. Um, so this is kind of the state of artificial intelligence. But then there came something that was not deep learning. It was Bayesian program learning, where they follow a pen. The pen was here making these symbols. And the, the machine would learn um, from this character what's the most natural way to follow this, this character here and then uh, to make this, this, this symbol. And it only needs a few uh, instances where it can, let's say this is the same, the same symbol, right? After seeing nine of them, it kind of learned, OK, I need to go up, down, up, down, or something, and then left. And that's it. That's all the machine had to learn, these, these, the length and the direction of each of these lines. And that was uh, enough to make the robot then draw some of those on its own. So you could say, well, it's not that hard. It's, it can only do just this. But it was still a remarkable paper because they're saying, now it doesn't have to have millions of these symbols seen in a brute force manner as deep learning kind of has to. Deep learning needs to see all these pixels of all these symbols millions of times until it actually knows what the symbol means. Versus this, this program learning just learns this program that says up, down, up, down, left. And that's a nice novel approach. But it's, it's still not very generic, right? You cannot do anything else other than just this one machinery. Um, so then Microsoft won the ImageNet or the Visual Recognition Challenge. It, it's, um, I don't think that's ImageNet, is it? Or it, may, it might be. I always confuse the two. There's two image classification challenges. And um, Microsoft won one. And then they said, OK, let's make this chat bot that is kind of um, not just for images, but also for text, right? It can understand tweets. It can start interacting with people. It's kind of smart. And unfortunately, it would start becoming a real mess because it would learn from people. The, the, the robot did a good job learning from humans, but humans were not that great, right? Humans were trying to fool with it. Humans were giving him bad input. And the, the robot would just respond in a way that was inappropriate. So Microsoft had to pull it after one day. And now they're like starting it fresh. But everybody is now making a chatbot that's kind of artificial intelligence, right? How well can you make uh, this chatbot? That's the real question nowadays. 
But what else can deep learning do? It can write handwritten text. So I typed in the sentence earlier. It didn't do it in, on its own, but it wrote it on its own. It learned to write handwriting style text. And every time you run this, it comes out slightly differently. So this is a, a cool example here. When you go to this website, it will actually explain it in a paper, how it does it, how it synthesizes text from the recurrent neural net's inner state. So this is part of deep learning that can do sequences. It, it knows what's the most likely pixel to be activated when you, uh, as the next thing, basically. It knows what's, what's the next thing in the sequence. And the same thing for here. It learns a mathematical proof. So it, it, it just reads a lot of like math papers, and suddenly it spits out a theorem on its own. And of course, it's junk. If you look at it, it doesn't quite make sense. But a novice might be confused for a while, right? And image captioning I mentioned earlier, uh, you can already have that, right? On your apps, on your iPhone, um, people can do this. You can, you can ask the iPhone, show me all the pictures at a beach where I was last year or something, and it will show you all your pictures where you were at the beach. So this is commonplace already. And this is Deep Trump for those of you who like the entertainment. Um, this is an actual Twitter, a Twitter account that is a recurrent neural net. This is a, a, a deep learning bot that spits out text. It's not a human that writes this. This is a machine-generated text that reads his tweets, Trump's actual tweets, and learns from it, and then spits out stuff like it. <laughs> <laughs> and it seems to work just fine, yes. And this is what Google is doing now. They acquired a startup a, a, a few years ago, I think, so you can translate images on the fly, right? You just go to a different country, you hold up your phone, and you translate everything that you see in the phone. So this is pretty cool. This is doing images and text at the same time. And they even render it in the same font as what you're seeing there. So it's, it's a pretty smart system. And well, lately, people have had fun with making art with deep learning. I'm not too fond of it, because um, it's just more like entertaining to see what the deep learning model does inside, right? But you can basically take a photograph and a Van Gogh, or Van Gogh, I should say, as a half Dutch um, painting, and you can say, make that photograph look like this painting. And then suddenly, it changes its style to be like a painting. In this case, they just took this, this sketch and made it like a um, romantic Impression. picture. Where's the question? Impressionistic oh. painting, I think, is what you want. Yes, impressionist painting. And you can say it's not bad. So Photoshop might have a plugin someday that is called deep learning style transfer or something. But the point is that all these things are not quite artificial intelligence, right? There is no Terminator running around with a mission. It's still only machines doing certain tasks that are um, designed by humans to, per to be just this particular task. And it can do a lot of things but it's not going to decide to, to do something extraordinary. It doesn't just um, start playing golf on its own or something. It doesn't have a bill at this point. But of course, if you program it to, say, minimize the chance of you getting hit by humans or something, it might decide to do weird stuff. So there is some danger. People are kind of afraid of that. Yes? It does seem like the main capability is recognition knowledge. The same as intelligence. Yes, correct. So the whole reasoning part and like deciding what to do next and all that is not quite um, done, right? Unless you have a rule for everything, but you kind of have to give that rule to the robot. Yeah, I'm wondering for the, uh, the AlphaGo example. Suppose if we enlarge the, the Go board from 19 uh, times 19 to say 100 times 100, mm -hmm. do you think humans will have some advantage or the machine learning will have some advantage? That's a good question. I don't know. If you made that AlphaGo board from 19 square to 100 square, who would win? Isn't it human just because? Probably too overwhelming for everybody. You do have this exponential. I would guess it's a random crap shooting.
So the point is that everything that cannot that can be automated will be automated, right? And that's a scary thing because if you know somebody who's driving a car right now or working at a bank as a teller or something, that's that's a dangerous thing. Bank of America has like thirty percent fewer bank transaction at the bank, but 50% more ATM transactions in the last year or something. So everything is getting automated. And things like driving or education even, online classes, online everything, once you record a video like today, you don't need to go anywhere anymore, right? You just watch it forever. So there's a, there's a kind of a danger that we don't need people anymore doing the stuff that we're doing. Um, definitely, um, financial planning, as you said, sometimes it still helps to be smart, right? But um, there might be somebody that makes a business out of this and then suddenly beats everybody else and then there will be fewer and fewer richer and richer people, as we're seeing that's already happening. So in the future, maybe people will be left with doing fun stuff only. There's no need to do anything complicated. And maybe we'll get the luxury of just enjoying ourselves, right? That's the optimistic outlook. Maybe we'll even get the eating machine. Um, for those who don't know this, uh, please Google it. Um, Modern Times um, eating machine. It's fun. It's four minutes long, so I'm not going to play it right now. But you can imagine what happens here. He's being fed food. <laughs> so this is Jerry Kaplan, who spoke here, I think, uh, a while ago. Um, he said. New York Times will say that robots are stealing jobs, and the Wall Street Journal will say profits are going up, right? And that's, that's true. That's what's going to happen. Everything will be changed. And that's what this deep learning pioneer is saying. He invented the recurrent neural nets in the 90s, the ones that learn these sequences, the text translation and sequence learning. Um, and Jeff Dean, he wrote basically TensorFlow, the stuff that's in Google's deep learning. He said, machine learning will touch every industry. And you can imagine agriculture, right? 200 years ago, uh, Jerry Kaplan also said the same thing here. Um, everybody was a farmer, basically. And they would say, well, today, if they knew, it, like, the, if they had a time machine and they knew that there's no need to do farming anymore, they would say, why don't you all relax? Why don't you take it easy? <laughs> You're so happy that you don't need to do this work anymore. But you all are still doing something else, right? You're all worrying about some business problem or some meeting or whatever, some emails. So you'll find something that you're worried about. And the point is that um, artificial intelligence enabled applications will be commonplace very soon. According to IDC, half of all the software developers will, will already use some plugin somewhere that uses some artificial intelligence. So all the decision making will be outsourced. And we like to think that that's where we can help because H2O itself is uh, a product of the company H2O.ai and it's all open source, you can try it. You don't have to pay for anything unless you're uh, really serious about it in a big company and even then you can get away not paying. And we're about to um, show you why you should pay. It's basically a very valuable proposition to understand that you can use machine learning in your business, right? And you want to make sure that you're using it effectively and that you're using it um, in a way that your data scientists can leverage it and become more powerful. So we enable the data scientists and the application developers and the infrastructure guys, Hadoop administrators and IT people for Spark and so on, to all work together to actually make a better solution. And we don't just have deep learning. We have gradient boosting, random forest, linear models, clustering, and so on. Many, many models, and we work in every environment possible. So um, R, Python, Spark, Scala, Java, whatever it is, or a GUI, a web GUI, we have all these interfaces. I don't want to bore you with the technical stuff, but I think we should do a quick demo or so to show you how this works, because it's really the, the strength of the product is the ease of use. And at the end, when you have a model, you also get automatically some Java logic that you can export, a single file that you can give to your IT person to say, put it in production. And soon you'll be able to put it in production yourself with the next generation product. So I'm going to show you a live demo on a 10 node cluster. So this is actually a live um, cluster right now. So this is 10 nodes. 
and each of these blue boxes is 32 cores, so 32 processors per machine. So these are 10 actual servers, each has 32 uh, virtual processors, 16 physical processors, but it doesn't matter. These bars basically get green when something's running, and they're blue if nothing's running. And this is the graphical user interface of H2O. It's called Flow. It's like an, a notebook, like IPython notebook, except that it's interactive. So I'm going to show a demo on a data set that has 116 million rows. So it doesn't fit into Excel anymore, but it does fit on this 10 node cluster. And to show you everything from start to scratch, I'm just going to memorize this path here, and I'm going to delete everything else make a new notebook. I'm going to say, import me a file. I'm going to enter the path. OK. Now it says, all right, let's read it. And I want to parse it. And when I parse this file, because it's a comma separated file, it's going to say, OK, CSV, comma separated. The first row contains the column names, year, month, day of month scheduled departure times, scheduled arrival times. So this is a flight data set where flights are going from origin to destination at a given time, day, and so on. And the question is whether it's delayed or not. So we have, we have actual a label that says yes or no, whether the flight was delayed by 50 minutes departure or not. And I can now say, well, here should not be a numeric column, but an enum. And enum is something that's different, like red, green, blue. And um, or I can say, no, it should be numeric, because more here means more. It's ordinal. They could also be ordinal categoricals. But in this case, let's just call it numerical. Um, and I can just do whatever I want here. It's day of week. I can make it enum or not. So basically, you have some control over the data as you parse it. And now it's actually parsing it. So we can go and look at the cluster status here, and you see that it's on all the nodes, there's some work going on parsing this file. It's already done. So I just read this uh, 100 million rows into the cluster. We can look at the file. The file is a frame of 160 million rows, 12 columns, and it's compressed to 2 gigabytes. On disk, it was actually 6 gigabytes. So we are doing a per column compression. So for example, the year goes from 1988 to 2008. That only requires to have one byte to store the different integer values in that range, right? You don't need to store um, anything but the offset from 1988 is it 0 or 1 or 2 or 3 or 4. So you can do this smart kind of compression, but you only store what you, what you need to do. And you can also look at, for example, the distribution of the distances in this data set. See most most distances are in the order of three four hundred miles. You can see that each node here has about two hundred fifty megabytes, twelve million rows per node. You can look at the, the compression into zero sparse integers, which is like a sparse column that has zero, and every zero is not even encoded. You just encode the non-zero. So you can do all these smart tricks to compress it away. You see mostly one byte, two byte, only one four byte integer column for some weird numbers like uh, carrier IDs or something. Anyway, this is a data set. So now I want to build a model. So either I click on this data set here and say build model. It's the easiest way. Or I select the model from here. See, there's lots of models. And you ask how easy it is to build a deep learning model. So let's build one. Click on deep learning. I say training, but now you see that there's only one frame to train with. That, that's not good data science practice. You don't want to just train on all the data you have, and then what? How are you going to know whether that was a good model or not? So you need to make a holdout set first. So I'm going to make a quick split here. Split the data into, let's say, 90, 10, randomly. So every row has 90% chance of going to one and 10% chance to go into the other one and they're randomly going down in order. They're just getting pulled apart. So now we have two splits. And now we can build a model on the 90% data and test it on the 10% data at the end. That's the right way of doing this. I can test at the end, or I can test while I'm training. 
That's called validation, especially if it's used for model parameter tuning. But we're not tuning it here. But we might stop the model early once the error on the validation set doesn't get any better. Once it's like as good as it gets, we might as well stop. Because we, all we care about is how well does the model that we learned to predict the delay, how well does that translate to the unseen data that we haven't actually um, looked at. You could argue you need to do a time-based cross-validation for the experts here because it's a time-based data set. You don't want us to shuffle all the data around, but that's a detail that we can leave to the experts. So I'm saying the response is the departure delay, yes or no. I can leave all the other columns in because there's nothing that would cheat here. There's nothing, there's no answer in here. There's no such thing as a, was this delayed or not column. That would be cheating. I took that out already. Now we have different activation functions, as I mentioned. The rectifier is the one I mentioned earlier, the zero or x max of that. So if it's negative, it becomes zero. And if it's positive, it's what it is. That's the fastest version to train. And I'm going to make four layers of 20 neurons each. And I'm going to pass one time over the data set. So we'll train one time with every single observation in that 90% split. So that's about 100 million observations. We're going to just process it one time. That's not the best thing. Ideally, it would run forever and say stop early once the validation error doesn't improve. Maybe we should do that. So I'll say do 100 epochs, but stop early. And where do I say that I stop early? Well, here somewhere. I say once I um, don't get better after three successive um, scoring events on the 10% holdout with the AUC, then I want to stop. And I want to stop, let's say, if it doesn't get better by at least um, 1,000. Okay? So if my AUC is a metric that says how good my model is, and it can be between 0 0.5 and 1. If it's, if it's less than 0 0.5, then it's really bad. So basically, 0.5 means it's a random model, and 1 means it's a perfect model. And once this number is the same up to 1,000s, let's say, after three successive scoring events, I'm going to say that's good enough. And I'm judging it on the validation error. So that's the, the, the predictions on this 10% holdout split that I haven't used for training. If on that we are done, basically if we're converged, we're, we're good. And you see all these other features we have, but you don't need to know about it. So this creates the cell. So in all, it was all mouse, right? I never typed anything. I'm building a deep learning model on my 10 nodes. And now it's starting to pump up the CPUs. It's communicating between them every time it's blue. And you see how it's busy pro uh, processing the data right now and learning. And you can go back here and see what it's doing. It says eight iterations so far. It got through 30% of the data. It's training with about 2 million samples per second. So this is very fast, how it processes through these airline um, data rows. Each row is 12 columns. But actually what it does is these 12 columns, they have airport codes and airline codes and all that. So in effect, this actually is 800 numbers that have to be fed into the neural net. So we can look at the model now here with view. And by the way, all of this is open source. You can run this on your 10 node cluster, your Hadoop cluster, your Spark cluster. Um, so here is some plots of the AOC curve on the validation data set, some gains and lift table for the experts here. But the, what I wanted to show you is the model has four hidden layers of 20 neurons. And the input has 749 um, neurons. So one of them says, what's the year? Because I said it's a number. The next one says, is it San Francisco or not? The next one says, is it Chicago or not? And so on. And then, and then 300 further, it says, what's this, uh, the destination? Again, San Francisco or not. Most likely, it's not going to fly to itself, but the model doesn't know, right? So it says, for each of this origin and destination, it's a 0 or 1. And only one of them is set to 1. All the others are set to 0. That's called one-hot encoding. 
and it's a bit wasteful. So we're actually adding a better way to encode these numbers into, into neurons such that it's not as wasteful. You don't need to do one hot encoding. You can, for example, take the, the integer bits in the 32 bits integer and just use those as activations, right? Then San Francisco will not just be one of them 300 different numbers, but it will be number 17, let's say, and will activate certain bits in the integer bit pattern. But anyway, that's, that's uh, also advanced stuff. But this is what's expensive right now, because each one of those 749 neurons has to talk to all the other 20 neurons. That's the biggest cost of this model. And it contributes to these 16,000 weights. So a total of 16,000 weights are needed to make this model. It's only 200 kilobytes. So the model is tiny, but the data is huge. The data is 2 gigabytes compressed. So you will assume that this is not that good a model, right? Because how can you memorize this whole 2 gigabyte data set with only uh, 200 kilobytes of, of logic? So let's see what the model does. Yes? Um, if you wanted to add your own logic, what you have to do is you go to Java here, right? And, and you type in like rectifier um, here. And you can see this is the rectifier. The for propagation is just doing some, some simple math here. This is, the, this is the zero or x maximum. So I'm doing half of the value plus the absolute of the value. And that is the same as the max of 0 and x. It's just like a mathematical trick to do it faster, because um, absolute computation is faster than doing an if-else in the maximum. But that's basically it. And then you need the backpropagation logic that says, if the gradient is non-zero, push it backwards. And this is an if-else statement that actually makes it faster on a CPU than on a GPU in this case, because I can skip many of these operations in the back propagation. So when the gradient is 0, the gradient is 0 because the activation is 0. So if the numbers that are coming in lead to a negative activation of this neuron, then its output is going to be 0. Because we said anything that's negative doesn't make any output noise. If it doesn't make any noise, then I don't need to fix it, because there's nothing wrong with it. So the, the absence of me having to force a correction saves a whole row in the back propagation, which can be thousands of numbers. So we can save a lot here with this if-else statement, because this guy is just going to return. Here, if it says, if the gradient is 0, here, if the previous value is 0, then continue. This will skip a whole um, inner for loop. Anyway, that's the detail. But you can see this is all complicated math. And I'm, I'm going to not have to do the same thing for the image recognition, because we're going to integrate with TensorFlow and other backends. And I'll show you that in the next slide or so. But here we are still at seven epochs, and it, the model still seems to get better. So I can reload the state now, because as this is training, I can still look at the model in a real-time fashion. You see here the error in log loss. This is the training error, and this is the validation error. So the, it trains a little better. Like what it, what it learned from the training set is, of course, it memorizes as much as it can. And then you ask, how well does it translate to the unseen data? And it's not, not usually as good, right? It has to be a little worse, because it didn't actually train on it. But it's still going down. So until this is flatlining for three times in a row, or flatlining significantly, we're not done yet. And we, this is log loss. We're actually interested in the stopping on the AUC, I said. So we can look at the AUC. Right now, it's 0.7. And if you look at the, there's a scoring history as well. You can look at this here. You can plot all this in R and Python and so on. You see the AOC here, 64, 69, 69, 69, 69. Still getting a little better, 70. But it's about done now. So I would assume that this model now should, should soon stop early automatically. So this was, yeah, it, it just stopped, see? It's done now. So the model self-terminated after only um, a few epochs. It didn't actually pass over the data set too many times. It only did over maybe eight times or so. So this is nice. This means you don't need to know how many epochs you need to, 
train over, you just take as many as it takes to converge. Okay? And you might say, well, how good is this now, this 0.7? Well, I can run the same thing, luckily. I can say model gradient boosting. That's normally the, the model that wins many Kaggle competitions. And I can just build the same thing, all defaults. 53 steps 5, let's just see how it does. And again, when that runs, it's also going to use all the cores. And keep in mind, this is gradient boosting, which is a serial algorithm. You build one tree at a time, and each tree um, fixes what's wrong with all the previous trees. So it's going to be very greedy. It's going to say, for every observation that I don't have quite the right prediction, I'm going to build an entire tree, basically, that looks at all these residuals that are left from the previous trees. So it's an, it's an additive model. And it's not easy to parallelize. But you can see that this model, after 15 or 16 trees, let's see how good it is. And that's the beauty of H2O. You can see this model in real time. And now you can also refresh it. And it keeps refreshing this here, if you want. The AOC here is only 66 so far, not 70. So deep learning actually beat a gradient boosting method on this, on this um, data set. And speed-wise, it's not that much slower, right? Deep learning would have been pretty good after one minute already or so. I just let it run a little longer. So you can see here, if I, if I went to like two epochs, my validation AUC was 69.8. And even after one epoch, it was already 69.7. So it's basically good enough after one epoch. 69 validation AOC. And now here the GBM at the bottom. Let's see how far it is. Okay, it's done now. Let's refresh the cell when it says done. So scoring is the most expensive part because it does it on the whole data set, right? It, it builds 50 trees and then it sends all 100 million rows down these 50 trees and each one has to then say um, what the prediction is. This got to a 69, zero, not, not 70. So GPM is basically not beating deep learning out of the box. And this deep learning model wasn't that smart. It was only four layers of 20 neurons. That's not that good, right? But it's still a good model, apparently, for this. Yes? Yeah, I, I believe your earlier slides said that you can export features uh, of a deep learning model. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you can, like, once, for the, do you have the GUI to do the, the, yes. the export? And also, uh, would you be able to interpret what those features mean? Like, you know, for, for visual recognition, you can identify here, here the eyes, nose, and so on. But for, like, for some air flight data, can get some meaning out of that feature. Um, that's a good question. So let me see. Um, if I'm going to the deep learning model here, if this was the deep learning model, I think there's a way to do this in the GUI here. I can say predict, I predict the frame. This is now the actual predictions. I think there's no way to do this from flow here, but from R, I would be able to say um, uh, predict uh, deep features or something, or uh, give me the deep features, and I can say which layer I want. So each row will not have its original 12 columns, but it will have its 20 neuron activations at that layer. And that's a data set transformation. And you can make these features, but there's no way really to know what they are. It's just the 784 inputs times the weight, plus activation function, and then again, and then those are the 20 numbers, for example. That's what you're getting, right? So I guess that the facial recognition is, is special because we are familiar with those it's features. Physics, right? It's Fourier transforms. It's, um, it's meaningful features. OK. So I'm going to go back here. I'm going to finish up. But just to show you some use cases, I promised I would show some use cases. So Progressive is using a <coughs> user-based insurance. So everybody drives a car with a device in it. It measures how you brake, how many cars you pass and how aggressive you are at the wheel, and it's based on that, it can make a model that's better um, than their average rate, so you get a better deal when you, when you drive nicely. 
and you have these videos, you can click on them. Uh, uh, the slides will be available if you're interested in how they're doing it. So based on data collected from cars? Yes, it's, it's an actual dongle that's on every car. So you will have your driving examined by them. But then they'll give you a, I don't know, a discount that's, that's worth it if you're a good driver. Market Share is a digital marketing company, so their clients are coming to them and saying, hey, we want to do a campaign. Can you help us like, target the right customers and so on? And they're building hundreds and hundreds of models for them, tuning them, building logistic regression models and so on with uh, the right p-values and offset and everything tuned such that the models are interpretable and they can say, if you do this and this with your customers, then they'll buy uh, this product more likely. Um, Nielsen is a consumer company, right? So they watch, they, they see what you'd watch on television and then they look at what you're buying online and they match that. So if you see like an ad of uh, Coors Light on TV after the soccer match or something and then you go to Safeway to buy that, they'll let uh, Coors Light know that, that their campaign on TV worked. And uh, Zurich Insurance does risk assessment. They, they won't tell us exactly what they're doing with H2O, but um, you can imagine an insurance company. And then Capital One, I mentioned earlier, they're using us for many, many use cases. And they actually had, a, I think we had six or 700 people off Capital One um, host us for several days there. To, to, uh, they're all actively using h 2 Yes? So to simplify quite a bit, I'm sure, you know, the state of, uh, I'm going to call it AI, which that was your second biggest box there, um, is a set of fairly well understood algorithms that uh, you employ at some application domain by tuning some parameters. Where is the real radical innovation left here? Well, that's machine learning, right? Now, whether we call this AI or not, that's the, that's the marketing translation, yes. So the um, AI would be when the machine actually does something that's even more astounding, right? When it starts making decisions for you. But I think it's, it's already we're at the point where people think like as soon as it feels a little creepy, it starts to become AI-like. So if the robot, for example, can walk next to you in a snowy park and carry 100 pounds of load, no problem, and then follow you everywhere you go, even at night, because you have nice vision cameras and all that, you would think like something is like, you know, it's pretty smart, right? And they can do all that. So did it decide to follow you the whole time? Yes, because it was programmed to. Now, how hard would it be for that robot to decide that it wouldn't be the best idea to follow you anymore, right? And at that point, I mean, this all becomes a little slippery. But what I wanted to say is that model tuning is important. That's how you do the dirty work of data science or the pretty work of data science. These are all talks of previous recordings and so on. You can look at that. There's entire slide decks on, on tuning deep learning models. And I just recently wrote this, this uh, tutorial series for R, Python, and Flow, how to tune your GBMs. And that applies directly also to deep learning and deep random forests and GLMs and so on. This is a genetic tuning guide how to get better performance out of your models. And all these links are live. Um, there's also booklets and so on. I wanted to point out real quick that TensorFlow and H2O are like on par. There was a KD Nuggets poll about what are people using, right? And both are at the same numbers, 190 each. And those are the highest numbers of all deep learning toolkits. So people always say, well, um, we know about Spark, MLLib, and H2O. Those are driving the open source data science adoption. But what about deep learning, H2O? How does it work for images and so on? Do we have GPUs? We always have to say, no, no, not really. But now we're doing this, right? So this is an actual um, um, TensorFlow integration demo. Where from H2O on a cluster inside of Spark, you can run uh, GPU TensorFlow models from H2O then get the model back into H2O, get a POJO out, the Java model, the scoring logic, and deploy that in your infrastructures. So we have this whole thing working right now for the regular neural nets that we have right now, but we're working on integration of convolutional neural nets and recurrent neural nets as well, so that you can have um, all the smarts that the Google papers are about, that you can just take these definitions of neural nets the protobuf files, let's say, and just put them into your Hadoop environment or Spark environment and train models.
The next level is then to make it easier for the data scientists to work with the IT people, the software engineers, and, and the, the management, the, the, the business des decision makers, and make a smarter product. That's what I was saying earlier with the business, make your business smarter. It's not just about the data scientists having fun with their problem. It's, it's about having a cluster spin up. It's about having the model be compared to all the other models of other people, having governance, how did you do it, and deploying the model in a way that can be controlled. And then if the model doesn't perform well in production, you want to roll back. And all this stuff will be um, made easier with the Steam product, which we're working on right now. So, uh, the name of the yes, yes, and many other names. It has to be water related, right? Everything is water. So we're going to New York in a few weeks and then to Dallas, Texas um, in October. So if you're, if you're there or know somebody there, we'll spend a couple days each on there. So yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. And uh, we're still hiring. And all, all of this is open source. If you have pull requests, we uh, appreciate it. Thank you.